you will hear a woman phoning an electrical repair company about a problem with a piece of household equipment. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Hello, Sinclair Electrical Services, Kevin speaking. Oh, good morning. Um, I believe you do television repairs. That's right, we do. Well, my television's not working, but I don't have a car. Can you come round to see it? That shouldn't be a problem. Good. <laughs> Can I just take a few details, then? Certainly. So, if I could start with your name? Yes, it's Mrs Douglas. D-O-U-G-L-A-S? It's double S at the end, actually. OK. And the address? 135 Park Hill Avenue. In Somerton? That's right. And would you like my phone number? Yes, please. It's 765... 482. 428? Two. Two, eight. No, 82. OK, right. So, what's the problem with the television? Um, low volume. Even when you turn it up to maximum, it doesn't seem to make much difference. I mean, it's quite an old TV, but it's always worked perfectly well up to now. And the picture's OK. Mm. I did wonder. We had a power cut a couple of days ago, and it's not been right since then. I don't know if that could have affected it. It certainly might have something to do with it. Anyway, I'll come over and have a look. Uh, can you tell me the make and model number by any chance? The number will be on the back of the TV. Mm, um, yes, it's uh, Schneider. That's S-C-H-N-E-I-D-E-R. And the model number's... Um, let me see. Yes, it's s v 5 Double O two. Right. Is that a fairly recent model? Mm, not really. I got it seven years ago. I remember the date because it was the year after I moved into this house, and that was eight years ago. I hope you can fix it. I really don't want to buy another one. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Well, I'll see what I can do when I come round to the house to look at it. I think I know your road. Is it the one that's off the high street? That's right. The house is on the left if you're coming from the high street, just before the road bends to the right. I'm afraid it's getting harder and harder to park on the road, but if you drive on round the bend, you can usually find somewhere. That's all right. Now, let's see. When would it be convenient for me to come round? Well, as soon as possible, really. Well, what's today? Friday. I'm booked up today, and then we've got the weekend, so I'm afraid it looks like Monday morning's the earliest. You can't come tomorrow? Well, Saturday morning I'm in the showroom, and I don't work Saturday afternoon and Sunday. OK. I'll make sure I'm in. Oh, and one last thing. I wonder if you'd mind telling me how you heard about us. We've just opened a new web page, and we're interested to see how effective it is. No, I actually heard about you from the woman next door. She couldn't remember your number, but I looked it up in the phone book. Oh, right. It's always the best advertising, word of mouth. Right. OK. Thank you, Mrs Douglas. Thank you. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now it turns to part two. Part two. Government's waste strategy. Yes. First, look at questions eleven to fourteen. Listen carefully. Good afternoon, Dr. Dartford speaking. Good afternoon, Dr. Dartford. It's Miranda Smith here. Oh, hello, Miranda. How can I help you? I'm really sorry, but I couldn't come to your lecture on the government's waste strategy yesterday because I was feeling ill. My essay has to be handed in in two weeks' time, and I'm worried I might have missed something important. I really don't like it when I miss lectures, especially when I need the information for an essay. Well, try not to worry. You can't help being sick. How about if I give you a quick summary of the main points? That'd be great. Thanks. Just let me get a pen. Right. I'm ready. To begin with, I stressed the importance of us reusing and recycling waste in the future. I made particular reference to the UK, which at the moment only recycles about eight percent of household waste. The levels of industrial and commercial waste are much higher. It's frightening how much waste factories produce on a daily basis, but that's not all. The fact is that not only is this rate of recycling well below government targets, but it's at a much lower rate than many other European countries, which means Britain is just not keeping pace with the rate of growth in household waste. That's pretty worrying, isn't it? It certainly is. What is more, we need to understand that if we are to achieve a more rational and sustainable use of our resources in this country, then we have to develop a fundamental change in the way we think about waste. That won't be easy. What suggestions did you propose?、Uh, just give me a second. Let me check my notes.、Uh, okay, got it. Basically, there are a couple of ways this could be achieved. One of these is for more household waste to be separated. You mean separated into things like newspapers, tins, and stuff like that? Yes, that's the idea. Then this separated waste would obviously need different forms of collection by local councils, but most importantly, it will require an expansion in the market for collected materials, which is one of the major barriers to increased recycling. New government targets have also been set for recycling or composting 30% of household waste by 2010. But that's almost a fourfold increase, isn't it? It is indeed. Rather a frightening figure, whichever way you look at it. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions fifteen to twenty. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. As you say, it's a fourfold increase, but my guess is it won't stop there. You must remember the previous government found that setting targets is one thing, but if the practical policies are not in place, nothing will happen. So, what is the government planning to do about all this waste? Well, apparently they're going to publish a final strategy setting out a range of policies to start and sustain the necessary changes. But the interesting part for me was that it's not only up to the government. To say we need more recycling is a simple message, but and here is the crux of the matter: there's another one that isn't getting enough attention. Really? What's that? It's quite obvious, really. It's us, the general public. We have to reduce the amount of waste we make. It's our responsibility. Did you know that every hour enough waste is produced to fill the Sydney Opera House, and the rate is increasing? Actually, now you mention it, I remember reading somewhere that the reason for all this waste is our increasing wealth and the changes to our lifestyles. 
I guess it's quite obvious when you really think about it. I mean, it's things like shops and supermarkets selling more prepackaged foods and ready-made meals. Convenience is the key. People simply want their lives to be more convenient. And there's also technological change that brings pressure to make people change their domestic appliances for newer models. I never thought about that, but you're right. And I'm just as guilty. I threw out my old stereo so I could have a better model, even though there wasn't really anything wrong with the old one. You see, you're a classic example that changing our present throwaway culture is going to be an enormous challenge. At the end of the day, consumers will have an important role to play. It could all boil down to their choices and their willingness to support recycling by sorting their waste and accepting more recycled products. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a student, Penny, talking to two friends, Ray and Louise, about a television competition Ray has entered called Travel Documentary. Before you hear the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Hi, haven't seen you two in ages. What have you been up to? Hi, Penny. Ray is really excited. He's just been shortlisted for travel documentary. He could be off travelling around the world for three months. Travel documentary? What's that? You've never heard of it? Don't you watch TV? Well, actually, no, hardly ever, especially since I've started working on my thesis. I don't have time to breathe, let alone watch TV. So what's this all about, Ray? Well, actually, it, it's a competition run by public TV. It involves my two great loves, travel and filmmaking. Is it that program where people are sent around the world making documentary videos? I have heard of it. Fantastic! So you've been chosen? Not yet. I'm one of 34 selected for an interview next week, so I've made it through the first cut. Yeah, there were over 200 applicants from around the country. Pretty amazing, hey? Well, I've been lucky so far. What's the next stage? 13 are chosen from the interview to do a four-week training course in documentary filmmaking. Then, the eight finalists get sent off with a video camera to travel around the world. Sounds incredible. What's the catch? The catch is that every two weeks, you have to send in a ten-minute video from a different part of the world. It's broadcast on TV along with the work of three of the other competitors and judged by a panel of experts and the TV audience. So you're under a lot of pressure. Wow, I guess so. You mean you're on television every two weeks? Yep, that's right. But first I have to be selected. Do you have to have any filmmaking experience to apply? Some background in photography or video making helps. But you're not supposed to be an expert. In fact, you can't apply if you've already worked in filmmaking. We all get the same four-week course, so we start with the same skills. Can you go anywhere in the world you want? Each competitor makes up his or her own travel plans and has to get them approved. Before the conversation continues, 
You have some time to look at questions twenty seven to thirty. Now, as the conversation continues, answer questions twenty seven to thirty. Have you talked with anyone else who has done it? As a matter of fact, just last week I met Sarah Price, a girl from here who did it last year. What did she have to say about it? She said it was the most amazing experience of her life, but it was really tough at times. I think you'd have to be really brave to take off like that alone with so much responsibility. It's not like going on a holiday, is it? <laughs> no. Two weeks in a country, often where you can't speak the language, to find a story, film it, organise all the editing. Then you're off to a completely different part of the world to start all over again. Pretty exhausting, but exciting too. What a way to see the world! What about Sarah Price? Did she have any bad experiences? She said the worst part was when she got some mysterious fever in Mongolia and thought she might have to be sent home. Fortunately, it got better, but she said it was scary to feel really ill when you're alone so far away. So, what made you want to apply? When I saw the program on TV a while ago, I thought. This is for me. I've always wanted to travel, but needed to work for a year before I could even think about it. Then a new series started up. I thought, now's my chance. Don't you think you'll be lonely? I don't think I'll have time to be homesick. I'm more worried about having too much to do and not enough time to get things organised. So we might be watching you on television in the next few months. I hope so, if I'm lucky. When will you know for sure? They choose the final eight in March. A month later, you're on your way. So, do you have to pay anything? Nothing. It's all paid for: course, camera, flights, accommodation, and in-country travel. The budget is pretty tight, though. No extras. I sure hope you get it. Then I'll be finding time to watch at least one program on television every week. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a lecturer talking to a group of science students. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-four. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to thirty-four. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the science faculty. As you may know, my field of study is neurobiology. So you may be wondering what I have to say to those of you who are studying physics or chemistry or geology, even those of you who intend to become doctors. In fact, what I have to say is aimed especially at those who wish to enter the medical profession, though the main point applies to all of you. And what is my main point? Basically, it is that you shouldn't get stuck in too narrow a specialization. What I mean is, too often doctors and scientists become experts on one small aspect of their subject and neglect the rest. 
Perhaps you have heard the joke about a doctor being introduced to another doctor as an expert on the nose. Oh, yes, said the other doctor. Which nostril? I know that more and more it is necessary to specialize, because when you finish your studies, you have to find a place in the job market. But I do believe that it is damaging both to you personally and to the profession. You may be surprised to know how many physicians in the past were men of wide culture. Many were interested in the humanities, from the arts to literature to philosophy. A surprising number of them, from Rabelais to William Carlos Williams, became poets, novelists, and playwrights. Men of science have written clearly and intelligently about society, psychology, and politics. This tradition is not dead. Today, such eminent scientists as Stephen Jay Gould, Jared Diamond, and Richard Dawkins are well known as popularizers of science while maintaining high standards. But more of them in a minute. I'm not saying that while you are studying anatomy, you should sign up for a course in English literature, but reading a few works of fiction in your own time will show you the human mind, just as your anatomy classes show you the human body. Science faculties and medical schools, it seems to me, now largely ignore this human dimension. Furthermore, the study of medicine, and psychology for that matter, is largely about what has gone wrong with the body and the mind. That is, it mostly deals with the abnormal. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 35 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 35 to 40. So, to try and correct this situation, if only in a small way, I have come up with some extra reading for you to do. Don't worry. I wouldn't have chosen them if I didn't think they were enjoyable as well as interesting. The first on my list I'm sure you've all heard of, even if you haven't read it, it's Bill Bryson's A Short History of Nearly Everything. Now, don't turn your noses up at it just because it's now officially a school book and is written to entertain as well as inform. In fact, I've found it a very good bedside book. Next come a couple of the writers I mentioned earlier. Any collection of essays by Stephen Jay Gould is worth reading. He writes clearly in a language non-scientists can easily understand. In fact, a lot of his essays are responses to questions about science from the general public. He's also entertaining on the subject of baseball. Perhaps you should start with Gould's Wonderful Life. He writes brilliantly about natural history and shows how much imagination and excitement there is in scientific discovery. Then, there's Jared Diamond's The Rise and Fall of the Third Chimpanzee, which shows us how close we are to the apes and forces us to look at some of the darker aspects of human nature. After reading it, you won't forget your animal ancestry. But don't let that put you off. It's very readable. You're probably saying to yourselves, just a minute, these are all science books. What about the fiction? I'll come to those in a later lecture. At the moment, I'm just trying to get you to read away from your chosen field of study. However, I will recommend one work of fiction now, though it might come as a bit of a surprise. If it does, it means you haven't read it. The book is The Water Babies by Charles Kingsley. I can see I have surprised you. Well, 
It is in fact the first fictional response to Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species. Yes, it is a children's book, but full of surreal fantasy and wit. The fourth, no, the fifth book on the list is a biography, The Emperor of Scent by Chandler Burr. To my mind, it's not particularly well written, but it is a fascinating story. It is about Luca Turin, a biophysicist who becomes an expert on perfume, and about how he missed getting the Nobel Prize. If any of you are thinking of a career in scientific research, this book might make you think again. It's a very tough dog-eat-dog -dog business, which brings us to the book that inspired Kingsley's Water Babies, that classic of the genre, Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species. If you haven't read it already, perhaps you shouldn't be here. If you have, it won't hurt to read it again. Or if you prefer, read his The Voyage of the Beagle, which as well as being of interest to any natural historian or anyone interested in scientific method, also makes a great travel book. Well, I think that's enough to be going on with, and I can see that it's time to finish up. So please bear in mind, throughout whatever course you are studying, not to neglect other aspects of your wider, non-academic education. Thank you. That is the end of Part 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.